Welcome to the Equinity Podcast, where horse owners just like you share their incredible Equinity stories and how Equinity is changing their horses' lives. Whether you're searching for something to give your performance horse better focus, faster recovery, and more stamina, or in the extreme case where all hope seems lost, give your horse what it needs to help heal at a cellular level, you'll find it here. So jump in on today's episode to hear how Equinity is helping horses worldwide. Now, welcome your host, John Dowdy. Hello and welcome to another Equinity podcast. I'm so excited this week to have on Cheyenne Wimberly out of Stephenville, Texas. Cheyenne, welcome to the Equinity Podcast. Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me. We're ready to talk some Equinity today. (laughs) Well, that's great. I'm excited to have you on. And for those tuning in and thinking to yourself, hey, I know that name, Cheyenne Wimberly. That's right. She is ranked number 14 in the world going to the NFR. How does that uh, make you feel? Well, you know, it's been hard to sink in, but now it's it's getting exciting because it's been 20 years since I've been to the NFR, so it's exciting to actually be prepared to kind of try to get back to reality over there in Las Vegas. Yeah. Now, let's, so 20 years. So uh, you were at the first at the NFR, 97, 98. Tell us a little bit about that and, and your hiatus that you took. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know... Um, that I, I had a really great horse back in 97 and 98 and then in 98 he had a career ending injury and so I um I have taken a break I, I went back to school and graduated and uh you know did some life things um and I continue to train for charity horses and train my personal horses but I didn't rodeo as much as I did and so this uh, this past year has really been a change in reality of getting back on the road you know, speaking of that, being on the road, uh, what was your favorite rodeo this year? Well, I, I I think I would have to say Cheyenne, which is kind of uh, ironic, right? But um, <laughs> Cheyenne's in July, and at that time, I, I had been rodeoing um, all all year, but I hadn't really, like, pushed myself. And I had three horses that I was riding at that time, and I had only ran them a couple times a piece trying to get with them. And then um, I I ran the fastest time of the rodeo at Cheyenne. And so that was like a big turning point at a really tough time of year because at that point you either need to keep going really hard or you need to go home. And so at that point it was like, oh, you know, those horses were starting to really – we were starting to click. Things were going good. And so that was really a turning point for my year. Yeah, so running the fastest time, then you're thinking, well, hey, maybe there's a shot. Uh, We're just going to go all in on this thing and see what happens. Yeah, at that point, it was like, you know what, we're going to keep going. We're going to um, put our head down and see if we can grind it out a little bit. But that only started to the next year, the next month that really was a grueling month. But, you know, when you're at this level, you either have to get all in or get all out. So we decided <laughs> to get all in at that point. <laughs> yeah, pretty much living, uh, well, on the road 24-7. Yes. Yeah. Living the dream. That's mm-hmm. right. Absolutely. <laughs> So for for those that are are looking or that maybe this is a kind of a dream for them uh, to reach the this high level, uh, what's the best advice um, well that you've been given just through the years in barrel racing and rodeo in general? Well, I'd have to start. You know, if I was getting into barrel racing from the start, you know, I'd I would make sure that my horsemanship skills were up to par. Um, I think that the whole industry starts with horsemanship, then it makes the rest of the learning a little bit easier. And then I would, there's tons of clinicians out there and I I would pick a style that you liked and I would stick with that style because it's easy to jump around, but then you never really master one. And I would learn and, you know, just become a student of the game and, and go through the levels. Nowadays, there's so many levels. You can start from a 5D level and work your way to the 1D level. And once you get to that 1D level, then you probably are ready to start entering, you know, the rodeos and going to the amateur ranks, to onto the professional ranks. You know, you, of course, it's like anything, but you're when you're mastering that skill and you've learned one thing, it's hard to jump around and continue to, to master that skill. So, um, you know, when you're trying to work your level up, and if that's your goal is to work up to the highest level, then you have to continue to master, you know, master each skill at a time. Sure. um, But the good thing of today is that, you know, there is lots of learning material. And um, you can, I mean, you can really be a student of the game. 
Sure. Absolutely. The technology that we have today and online stuff and uh, plenty of clinics around for sure. Correct. Yeah. So with, um, here's a good question for you. Um, at least I think it is. Uh, so with the rodeo season, as long as it is all the miles that you travel, you know, what keeps you motivated? Um, typically what, what's your day look like, you know, especially maybe after you've come out of a, a bit of a slump, um, what do you do to keep yourself high energy and focused on the, on the goal that you're trying to achieve? Well, I'm, I'm a, person of pretty high goals and so if this year I haven't I haven't rodeoed professionally full-time in 20 years so when I it became a goal that hey I'm, I'm going to make the NFR then going home wasn't an option and when going home is not an option you have to stay positive to reach that goal and I, I surround myself with positive people um, negativity is a killer of all sorts I mean it, it will it's it'll drag the whole rig down but you know, um, when you're running at that level, you're, you're, there's so many things that are out of your control, the weather, the ground, um, you know, you're indoors and outdoors. But the one thing you can control is your, your positivity and your goal, because that goal was to make it to, to the end. And um, I just reminded myself constantly that, you know, what, we're out here for a reason, and that reason is to accomplish it. And it's a high goal. And sometimes a lot of people don't don't get to accomplish it, but they, I bet they've proven to themselves that they are able to accomplish it. And maybe that's one of the building blocks to the next part. So, um, you know, I it wasn't like I was going to have a lot of do-overs. So it was like, you know what, we're going to put our head down. We're going to work as hard as we can. We're going to keep the horses as healthy as we can, and we're going to try to accomplish the goal that we set. Sure. Now, you just mentioned, and I touched on this before, and we kind of skipped over it, um, you haven't been back to the NFR in 20 years, and uh, I had mentioned earlier about the hiatus. So you had a um, career-ending uh, injury with the horse that you had back in 99. So what did you do through those 20 years there up until this point where you just came back into the picture? Yeah. I'd like to say I was just a couch potato, but I wasn't. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. I, um, I went back to college. I had about a year left of college. I went back to college. And then um, I started working in the insurance industry and I worked the industry in that industry for several years, for about five years. And I I continued at that time to train horses for myself and I never quit riding ever. But, um, and then I started, I would say probably um, I got into the breeding business a little bit and I had four or five brood mares and I, you know, read, raised and bred my own colts and trained them, sold them. Then I would say probably it's been the last 10 years I have raised or bought name brand. I say name brand, and I mean the Dash to Fame, the Streak to Flings, the Frenchman's guys. I would buy one or two colts a year. I would get them to buy them as two-year-olds. I would train them for churdium and get them seasoned and ready for somebody to buy them to go rodeo on. That was the end goal. Now, some of those don't make it to that level, and those horses were sold at the level that they needed to be sold to. But it was kind of a business that I would, I would ride about anywhere from five to eight horses a year selling the ones that I make and, you know, bought, make, and sell. That's kind of the rotation of it. Um, and I've done that for the last probably 10 years um, up to now. So it wasn't like I was out of the game. I mean, I, I still did it a lot. I just didn't do it at that level. So as you're out on the road doing these things, was it the Cheyenne um, run that kind of said, hey, maybe maybe we've got a chance here to get back to the NFR? Or what, what was your mindset? I yeah, I don't say that. I was offered some really great horses this year. Um, I don't own a couple of the horses that I'm taking. Robin Weaver owns them. And, I mean, they were great horses. They've been outstanding horses through their fraturity and derby years. They're, I mean, outstanding horses. I was offered those couple of horses and it was kind of one of those things. I had another two horses. I had a horse that I had won Chicago on the WCRA on, and um, that was a really good building horse. Then I had another horse that I'd had for about two years and her name's Dash to Sue's. And she, she was continually getting better and better and better. And I was starting to run her outside. So I had these combination of horses. And then I thought to myself, you know what? 
I may never have this group of horses in my barn again. So if if there was any inclination that I might want to go again, it would be a good time to try it now. But now it was kind of hard because I wasn't qualified into any of the bigger building rodeos. Hmm. So I kind of had to do it the hard way. You kind of had to just start at that bottom level, try to get into the next rodeo and the next rodeo and, and travel more than you probably would ever want to travel. But <laughs> when you're starting at that ground level, you got to start somewhere. It, even though I had been to the finals 20 years ago, I didn't have any kind of leeway getting into anything. You right. know, I wasn't like granted an, an entry. Sure. So you had to start from the bottom and sure enough, just kind of get after it and, you know, try to enter at the right places, go to the right rodeos and win, win at the right ones. Yeah. Um, That's yeah, incredible. Really that is an incredible yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say that, you know, we we all like a good comeback story. Something and after twenty years it sounds pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. So I gotta ask you this because uh, you know, being around a lot of professional athletes through the years, um, they all seem to have uh a rituals, quirks, anything like that. Is there anything that you do specifically that's just your own little thing before you uh run a pattern? I like to be prepared real prepared for myself so I usually like this time around I hadn't been to some of the places and I had been to some of them and by now they've built new arenas new facilities you know it's not the same um so I I would make sure that I would find a video of the of somebody running mm-hmm. barrels in that arena. Yeah. I felt like that prepared me, like pre-prepared me. It got me in the state of mind of, hey, where the barrels were set at, kind of where the alley was, and maybe what horse I was going to ride. Because I rode four horses throughout the year. And through the summertime, I rode three. And so I was riding three different horses every weekend. So I wanted to make sure, you know, it's kind of like a dice game, but I didn't want to roll the dice and hopefully I picked the right one. I wanted to make sure when I got on that horse, that was the right horse for the right pattern at the right time. And uh, I didn't do any quarterbacking. When I picked that horse for that pin, I went with that. And most of the time I had picked that horse before I got there because I had prepared myself through videos and preparation of getting there. And um, so I felt like, you know, it wasn't going to be something new when I got there. Sure. Not just some pull up and uh, willy nilly. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I don't do very, I mean, I wanted to make sure when I got there, I kind of knew what I was getting into because, you know, you don't, sometimes you don't have all that time to get up there and, oh, I want to do this, this and that, or get to ride an arena or stuff like that. So I felt like being prepared before I got there was, was really a a benefit for myself. Mm Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, uh, also through the years, um, you also have a saddle company. Yes. Yes. Yeah. My family, um, my family, we started Cowboy Classic Saddlery, um, about 25 years ago and, um, my dad started it and I'm, I'm the only child. So of course you get brought into all things family. (laughs) And, um, but anyways, yes, we sell numerous saddles. We sell a lot of trophy saddles. We make several different saddle lines for a couple of different barrel racers. And um, we, we majority sell roping, team roping saddles and barrel saddles. That's really our business. And um, we've done a lot of trophy lines. We, we, we've made saddles for like the college national finals, for the NFR, for the Texas circuit finals, several circuits. We're currently doing the Southeastern circuit finals. So we make a lot of saddles for several different organizations and individuals. So it's been a great business. My mom and I continued to run it when we were on the road. Thank goodness for FaceTime so you could run your shop while you're driving. No doubt. You know, um, yeah, technology changed everything for everybody because <laughs> I don't know what we would do if we hadn't had technology. Yeah. Now, the uh, yeah. website is CowboyClassicSaddlery.com? Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, anybody listening? And you're, yes, and if you call, you're probably going to talk my, to my mom or myself. So um, we're still pretty – we're definitely hands-on. We um, – we didn't get to the summer, but we usually, majority of the time, we are messing with every saddle that leaves, leaves the shop. Great. Yeah. yeah. So getting into the um, your your program for your horses to keep them in top shape, what are some of the things that you've done through the years uh, prior to coming across Equinity? Because we'll get into a little bit of that. Um, 
Um, so what are, what are some of the things that you do to, to keep your horses in tip top shape? Well, I would say when I'm, I, I first like to start with a foundation. So I feel like a good clean feed is, is really important. I, I try to feed zero sugars, no molasses. I personally feed oats and sunflower seeds. I do not, I do not feed a feed that has any type of byproduct in it or any type of soy. Um, so I, I like to start clean, and then I try to find the best hay quality that I can feed. We also turn most of our horses out on our rotation through grass, and we have coastal Bermuda in our area. So, you know, we don't have them all in stalls all the time. They're all rotated in through some kind of pasture. But I feel like when you start with a good basic program, then you can add to your program what you feel like your horse needs. Um, I've always fed herbs from equine natural care. I feed their herbs and I fed herbs for years and years. Um, but I also educated myself with herbs. So I don't feed the same herbs over and over. I feed like what I feel like that horse at that time kind of needs and gets it through its system. Um, you know, I'm pretty basic. So I feel I've, I feed along that line. When I came to the point of equinity, I actually had talked to a couple of different friends that I knew who was giving it. And I, I kind of asked around about their stories. But when I started feeding a quinity, it was simply amazing the difference that I was seeing in the horses that were getting fed a quinity. Um, maybe something that was a little bit more added to such a high performance athlete, you know, their recovery I mean, they were making two, three runs a weekend, and we're talking every weekend driving 400 miles in between each run. They were making those runs every weekend from July to September, and they were just rebounding greatly. They looked outstanding. They looked like show horses. They never lost weight. Their hair coat was shiny, dappled out, and, you know, they might be a little bit tired on Monday, but on Tuesday they were – ready to go and it was just amazing that you could see that difference on such a athletic level right well and those for tuning in for the first time um what i'll I'll give a little bit of education on what the equinity product is it's 100 percent pure amino acids Uh, there's no fillers no sugars no starches just 100 percent pure aminos but these are specifically formulated and put together to stimulate the pituitary gland, which is the master gland in the body. And that's what releases the necessary hormones, which help keep the cells operating at their optimal levels. So when it comes to uh, high performance horses, like we're talking about in this case, faster recovery, more stamina, focus, they haul better, their recovery just overall, um, they look fantastic. Um, And you get into horses that are having all kinds of other issues, whatever it might be. Again, we're giving the body what it needs to release those hormones so the body can help heal itself. So it's customizing to each horse. Um, So I would uh, just guess that when people saw you pulling into the uh, showgrounds, they're like, ah, crap, here comes Cheyenne and those good looking horses. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I would say like numerous times I would have people say, gosh, your horses look outstanding. I can't believe they look like this, you know, being hauled and you know because really and truly the trailering is just probably harder on them as the running (laughs) and you know we say that we weren't really going that far but we were going 400 miles every day you know we were going back and forth because you're just you're up in the northwest at that time you're you're just making some big circles you know Mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like that bad because you're not driving all night but it it is it's still a lot of miles and they were looking I mean, outstanding. They came home looking as good as they did when they left. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. I mean, it was just one of those things that you just couldn't believe it, that it you kept having to go back. It has to be the program is working, you know, so you just had to stick with your program. Sure. And I know one of the other things, um, you have a PMF machine? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. So in combination, Mm -hmm. that's what we try to do our best to educate people from our side, you know, and although the Quinity product does a lot um, for your horse, you know, 
it always helps to be in tune with your horse uh, and know what they really need. But in combination with um, all of these different things, it is a dynamite product, if I do say so myself. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, well, that's awesome. Well, uh, as we wrap up here, uh, is there anything else uh, that you would like to touch on or any advice that you would have to give or maybe somebody that might be on the fence about trying the equinity, anything you'd have to say to them? Well, I... I don't really, I mean, I feel like they, they need to try it. I mean, it, I have truly never seen horses that look as good as they look. And I also know, I mean, we talked about this earlier. I make saddles for Bob and Marnie listener. And so Marnie and them have used your product also. Well, mm-hmm. their horses are high performance horses. And I feel like if you're starting to see it with trend where multiple people and trainers are using the product, it's probably good to try the product. You know, we can all read about it, but until you try it, you can't be a believer. But I'm definitely a believer, so I feel like it's definitely going to stay in my program because I can't imagine my horses performing without it because I feel like as an athlete myself, I mean, we exercise hard and we train hard. We take amino acids too, and the recovery is just phenomenal when you're not on it until you are on it. So it's kind of one of the things I feel like if it works for me, I got to try it on my horses, and now I've seen it work on my horses, so I feel like it's just a win-win situation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Cheyenne, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out. I know you're very busy, and um, it's uh, been a great call. I know there's a lot of people that are going to get a lot out of this. So uh, Cheyenne Wimberly from Stephenville, Texas, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You bet. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode of the Equinity Podcast. For more information on purchasing Equinity, be sure to visit our website at teamequinity.com, where you'll also find product information as well as more testimonials on how others have seen amazing results by implementing Equinity into their horse's supplement regime. We'll have more stories on how Equinity is helping horses worldwide right here on a future episode of the Equinity Podcast. 